Hi guys, thanks, thanks for coming. I know it's still nice outside, so I really appreciate you being inside here listening to me. What I wanted to talk about is why we have to be careful of what we do next, because we will be running the world uh, as a tech industry, and we will be defining what the future will be like. It's sort of in, condensed in one statement. Oh, and maybe I have to switch this on, this usually helps, uh, which is this one. The you know, best way to predict the future is to create it. But if you turn this around, any future that we in this room or at this conference are creating will be the future of more or less everyone. Because tech is changing the world. Right? And the way we create this technology will define the way the world looks. So when you think of starting your company or running your company or making decisions on your way, think hard, because you're defining what the future world will look like. Who knows who said this, by the way? This guy. The time when the US still had good presidents. Right, very sharp man. <laughs> Wasn't in office for too long. Being a good president in the US is kind of risky <laughs> for your life. Anyway, remember the old times before the internet? If you're old enough, you may. If you're not, you won't. And don't worry, you don't need to. But we had all these wonderful communication tools like AOL or BTX in Germany or Minitel in France or CompuServe. Uh, which provided us with email and a kind of browser experience, but sort of inside a frame, inside a piece of software. AOL, you know, they were the guys that were sending around dis diskettes and CDs like crazy, right? They were swamping the world with plastic. Uh, and you installed the client and you were inside AOL, and you could not send an email to anybody else before the internet came. Then the internet came, and why it worked? I don't know if you realize that, is because it's all based on open protocols. All these, if you're not techy, forget them, but you know, this is how you send email, this is how you do web browsing, and all of that, and nobody owns the protocols. They're open. And all the implementations of these, your web servers, your operating systems that run the internet, your Linux and all that stuff, is open source software. And it is free, as in free beer. You know, you can download it for free and consume it, but it's also free as in freedom. You can change it and make it work for you. So, you know, 20, 25 years ago, these protocols and technologies became available, and smart people, like the founders of all the companies that we now know, realized that they can use this and turn this into services that scale like crazy to the whole world and provide services to everyone. Now, that has changed our life quite a bit, hasn't it? I mean, at least since we have our wonderful phones, you know, we're spending about 100% of our waking time you know, inside the phones. I mean, you wake up first thing in the morning, right? You go to the blue and you take your phone, you go like, no, you don't do that, right? But anyway, after that you do. And so you're spending our time. I mean, we're sending 156 million emails per minute. Right? Open Exchange is an email company, so, so we are running a lot of that email. With, you know, our software provides an open and free implementation of email. So it's pretty interesting when you think of it. Now make this a day. How much of that is spam? How much is really useful? I think we are really, really changing the world. Now, we can't live without these things anymore. right? And we want to build companies that provide services like this a great deal. And a lot of people do. Unfortunately, in a format that is neither free nor open, but instead very monopolistic. Instead of extending the open ecosystem that the original Internet originally was, a few companies, five or ten, are trying to take full control of the Internet by turning everything into a plat platform where you get locked in, where it's very hard to get out, that is not federated, that is not very friendly neither to an industry that we all participate in, nor to technology, nor to anything else except themselves. And they do that very successfully. And these companies, when you look at market valuations, you have that here. 15 years ago, you know, it was oil companies and General Electric, you know, Bank of America, Exxon, you know, these guys that sort of you know, were the landmarks of very large and wealthy companies. Fast forward to today, the five most expensive, most valuable companies in the world are GAFAM. You know, the guys. Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. And actually, those numbers from the end of 2016, if you look today, they're, they're almost 50% higher already. 
So not only are they the top five, but by a huge margin to the next company. You know, when you look at like telcos or so that are huge, they are, you know, Apple is probably at, I don't know, 750 billion now. You know, and the next company is maybe at 200 billion. That is not, not one of the GAFAM companies. So amazing wealth that is created by creating what, you know, what, what I like calling Hotel Californias. You know, the Eagles song, remember that? We're going to have music here at the conference. I'm really looking forward to that. Great song, by the way. It's about lock-in, right? You, you, you know the line, right? It goes like, you can always check out, but you can never leave. I mean, this song is about drugs, of course, right? But our drugs, right? Our internet drugs are pretty similar. It's very hard to leave. Now, maybe mobile came to the rescue. You know, all this your whole new ecosystem, you know, the computer in the pocket, you know, we could, you know, create apps like a dime a dozen, but when you look at your phone, one company owns half of the apps that you're using, and two companies own the platform. Right? That doesn't help. Oh, it's two of the five that I mentioned before. Oops. Right? That doesn't help. Remember this. When you put all your life into cloud services, you, your life sits on somebody else's computer. Just think of this. Always have this picture on your mind where you go like, okay, do I really want to put this data that I'm now creating onto somebody else's computer? Do I trust this somebody else so much that I should? I like the eyes of the guy, you know, they're like... <clears throat> now, why is that important? Controlling data has always been important. You know what that is, right? So the old sinner was kneeing here, talking to the guy inside, who probably had a glass of wine while he was listening to you, you know, sitting on a soft chair. This is 1,500 years of uh, European government called the church. Right? And they've created a great system to get to the data by the means that they had at the time, which was technology zero, right? building wooden boxes and great churches. But they made everybody come and confess whatever bad things they've done and whatever they knew about somebody else. So that was the NSA of the times, right? Pretty smart. If it didn't come, you're going to burn in hell forever. So you better come. That's a huge motivation. But then, you know, unfortunately for them, right, the, the um, Renaissance came by. Uh, people divided state from church. In some countries, they're trying to pull this back in some other countries, which is probably not a great idea. And people had to revert to, to the technologies available. Like here we are at a location where, you know, a lot of news were created, you know, for the purpose of keeping the people aligned with what the state did. And to make sure that they did, they didn't have the confession boxes anymore, right? so they had to do something else. They had relatively primitive technology right, to get to the data. Um, they tried to hire every tenth person of the country to do spying on the other nine, right? And that kind of worked, kind of not. But now the state doesn't exist anymore, so maybe it did not work so well. So what about today? Right? Mr. A, Mr. M, Mr. A, and Mr. G and Mr. Mrs. F, in this case, were also there. So it's very easy to take one plug and plug it into five companies to get to the servers where your data resides. So what we do here and the decisions that we make are about freedom, your freedom, the freedom of the world in the future, nothing less. If we are watched all the time, we change our behavior unconsciously. Go to this website, it's pretty cool. It describes the feeling. I know the feeling because I was born in the GDR in Leipzig. And you had a public persona and you had a private persona when you felt safe and no Stasi guy was close. Then you started opening up. But still, you, know, you felt like you were watched even as a child. You felt that you were being watched all the time and you changed your behavior because you've already lost your freedom. So don't say, I got nothing to hide. We all got nothing to hide. 
But if we're being watched all the time, we lose our freedom and we start behaving differently. Now, what does that mean? Mr. Lincoln, what does that mean? What shall we do? So moving forward, I thought about one sort of simple set of rules that we can apply to everything that we do as a consumer, but also as a producer of services. You want to start companies, right? So what can you do to produce services that are different, that keep the internet open, that keep us free? And there are simple rules. They go like this. If you have no choice, if you only have one provider, bad. Because that means having no choice equals monopoly, equals lock-in, wrong. Number two, you must be able not to only switch to another provider, but also to take your data with you. you now, how about digital rights management? How about moving from Amazon Kindle to something else? It's like you're buying a new bookshelf from IKEA, and every time you buy one, you lose all your books. Right? Not good, right? So you have to be able to take your data with you. You might say, yeah, there's a Facebook backup download. Yeah, great. Who has done a Facebook backup? Who's using Facebook? Uh, OK. Try the backup. I mean, it's all your data inside. You put it in there, right? And then look at what you get. It's not nice. So to create an ecosystem, you have to be able to set up your own service, because you may not trust any of the service providers out there. You may want to be your own. You may want to have your data at home for some specific purpose. Or if you're a company, you say, nah, you know, I better have control over what's, you know, where my data sits uh, with all my company's knowledge. But still, you would have to trust the software, and that's a problem, and this is why the software of the service has to be open source. You have to have access to the source code so that you don't have to trust the maker of the software. Because you won't change anything if you run a black box that still phones home and sends all your data there. Open source is the answer you know, to, a, to the question of freedom in the future. Isn't that incredible? When you think of it, you may not have thought of this this way, but it is the tool because open source inherently is different from the rules of the big platforms. It creates open ecosystems. They are always federated. What does federated mean? When you set up your mail server or your DNS server or your web server, you plug it in and the whole world sees you and you, and you participate in the global community. You don't have to know what my email server is who my provider is, what the brand is. You just send me an email if you have my email address, right? That's open and federated. Not on WhatsApp, not on Snapchat, not on you name it. Right? You have to know where I am, because it's not federated, it's a silo. Closed. Do you trust the encryption of WhatsApp? Yeah, maybe. Because it's in their best interest to keep it closed. But if they get called into Mr. Trump, what can they do? Even if you trust them being honest to you. And they may be, I'm not saying they're not but they have to work under certain rules. So open source is the antithesis to the centralistic, monopolistic systems. If you want to create a new service, go down this route. You create a community that participates. It gives you leverage. It gives you disruption, because you are in a completely different business model. It's always good when you're a startup to do something completely different, just to play outside the playing field that the others are in, because you cannot directly compete with the giants. This is very good to change this rule book, because you're playing a completely different game. And this is what we do at Open Exchange. Okay? Thank you very much, Rafael Laguna, for your speech. Thank you.